All right, welcome to Christ Center Discussions on Pal Talk. It is Wednesday, January the 6th, 2021. Another year, praise the Lord. Another year closer to His coming. Amen. Bless this food that we are about ready to receive, Father, and may we be filled, nourished, and strengthened by this food. Give us this day our daily bread, our daily portion of Jesus Christ. And in His name we pray. Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to cover the second letter to the church of Smyrna. So we're just going to start off and we're going to jump right into it. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, but they are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. And be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He that has an ear, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. All right. So as we as we read from Scripture, the uh, this was a, a persecuted church. It was around 180 to about 313 A.D. And this is this is the age of Constantine. It was the emperor who made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, which is how it became what we know as the Holy Roman Empire. So. Now, the early church lost everything to believe in Christ. And that should sound familiar, right? Matthew uh, 10 and verse 39. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So the, the church in Smyrna was heavy pers heavily persecuted. And this period within church history was just, it was devastating, right? It, it was estimated maybe... They document this, but it was uh, nearly 5 million men, women, and children were martyred for being a Christian during that 200 years. The book of Acts testifies that the majority of the persecution came from the Jewish people themselves. This was the time of Caesar Nero that was a big persecutor of the church. And what they would do is, is they would take these Christians, didn't matter, male, female, children, all, it didn't matter. Babies, they'd throw them into large, you, the, the large coliseums and they would fill them with, with these Christians. And then they would proceed to, to let the lions loose and then it would just turn into a big show for the, the spectators, right? They, they loved it. They roared. They, they just enjoyed these Christians getting devoured by these lions. And this, this all went on during this time. It's all documented in history. So this church was a very, very heavy perse persecuted church during this time. It's one of the reasons why Smyrna is called the persecuted church, right? It's interesting that the actual word, the actual word as well, Smyrna, can be traced back to the root word for the Greek word myrrh, right? Franken, Franken gold, or gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So, um... The first thing that we think of that is the, the wise men that brings to baby Jesus. But those, those have more meaning, right? Uh, the gold denotes Jesus as the king. The frankincense denotes Jesus as the priest. And the myrrh, symbolically here, denotes Jesus' death, right? It, myrrh was used for embalming. So it's interesting that Smyrna is represented by myrrh. And I don't believe that it's, it's just coincidental that that's what it means, right? Myrrh was used for death. I believe it represented the persecution, the trials, the tribulations that Christ endured unto death. And that's exactly what was happening in, in this time in church history for 200 years. Death to the Christians, right? And we also see that myrrh is used in embalming in John 19.39 and for deodorizing. Um, in Esther chapter 2 and 12. So, Smyrna means myrrh, right? That's, that's his definition. Uh, it's a, it was a highly valued spice as well as uh, used for death, as I keep saying. Um, 
It was the primarily the primary ingredient in the anointing oil that God commanded Moses to make in Exodus. Right? You can read that in chapter 30. Um, it was used to consecrate the tabernacle. The ark, two of the altars, all of the utensils, as well as Aaron and his sons. So, being set apart, right? So in Smyrna, we see a people who are set apart and consecrated whose lives are dedicated to God despite the cost. Okay, so a second use, like I said, was Esther, where, where eligible maidens were prepared for 12 months before they were sent to meet the king. So for the first six months of the preparation, they were purified with the oil of myrrh. Right, we read that in Exodus chapter, or Esther Esther chapter 2, if you want to look at the history. Now, looking at this spiritually, myrrh could represent purification before being able to meet the king of kings, right? Because that's what they did master. It was used before the women would meet the king. So spiritually, it's a purification to be able to meet the king, right? That Jesus is our king. All right, so let's just break these verses down and see what's going on here. Revelation, we're going to start with verse 8. That's where we left off. All right. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write these, th write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now, I want, to, I want to point out the first thing is that Christ has an attribute here, the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. This can literally be stated, who died and lives again. Christ knew what was going on in the church, and he wanted to let them know that he understood, right? Christ is relating to this church. Christ could feel their pain. He could feel their trials and tribulations. He could relate because he was also martyred. He was also persecuted. He was also put on display for the world to see, right? He was inflicted. So there should have been an, an encouragement to the church of Smyrna. Jesus gave his life for the church. Or he became dead and he lives forevermore. And notice, is alive. This is a present tense. He lives. Amen. He is king forever living. And I believe he used this attribution because he suffered and was persecuted unto death himself. Just as the Christians here in the church and within this first 200 years were being extremely persecuted unto death. And Christ was telling him, hey, I died. I get it. But I live, and you will also live forevermore, right? Should be very, very encouraging message or letter to this church so far. Now, what I see is that the attribution kind of denotes what was going on in the church at that time. But it speaks of two things. One, it speaks of the eternality of Christ, the first and the last, and the humanity of Christ, who was dead and and has come to life. Okay? A little bit about Smyrna. It was about 35 miles north of Ephesus. Today, it is the third largest city in Turkey. It's called Izmir. It's got a population of about 300,000. Homer was born right around Smyrna. It had a, a huge port. It was a commercial city. The original city was actually destroyed about 627 BC and it was deserted and laid in ruins for 400 years. And Alexander the Great, when he ruled over the greater part of the world at this time, he wanted to restore it. So he constructed the plans, but it did not get finished until after his death. The city was built a little bit south of the older city and it became one of the finest cities in Asia. It was known as the Glory of Asia or, quote, the flower of Ionia. There were temples built there. They were beautiful temples built for the memory of Homer. It was a cosmopolitan kind of place for the people of that time. Very wealthy city. And myrrh, interesting enough, was their chief export in ancient times. Smyrna was also known for its schools of science and medicine. And during the reign of Tiberius, the city was almost destroyed by an earthquake actually a series of earthquakes pretty well demolished it and Marcus Aurelius rebuilt Smyrna in 378 no no Marcus Aurelius rebuilt the city 
fight. And then in 378, the city was nearly destroyed again, but it was rebuilt. So there's a lot of destroying going on here. But this is the city that the letter was written through. Right? Smyrna, it means death. It's myrrh. Verse 9. Okay. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and they are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I know your works. This was their general manner of life, right? This I know about your life. Christ says this to every, every church, pretty much. He sees everything and knows everything. And it, it's a comfort to know that Christ is intimately involved in our lives. Right? He says that he knows. I know your tribulation. Now, the Bible's clear. Tribulation is going to be part of a Christian's life. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say our lives are going to be a bed of roses. Right? We got John 16, 33. These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 2 Timothy uh, 3 and 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it, it's, it's not that it, it might happen. It's going to happen. Tribulation is going to be there. But in Christ, we will have peace. Amen. I mean, I could go on and talk about Paul and his shipwreck and suffering and hunger and nakedness. But he had peace, right? We can have joy in the midst of it. Everyone that desires to live for Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but Jesus Christ will give you peace. Amen. Now, I know your poverty, but you're rich. Yeah, this, this word poverty is not the most common word in the Greek being used here. It means that they were extremely poor is what it means. They were in extreme poverty. These people were extremely poor. That's, that's what the Greek word implies. And the only other place in the entire New Testament that this Greek word is used is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, where it talks about Jesus Christ, that he was rich, but yet for your sake he became poor. That's the only other place this extreme poverty is at. Let's read that. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This is a beautiful picture. I don't know about you guys, but it's a beautiful Christ, beautiful picture. He was rich. Of course, he's, he's the glory. He is God. In heaven, in his deity, shining victorious, beautiful, everything. I mean, he was he's rich, but he became poor for our sakes, that through that poverty, we might be made rich, amen, that we might come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and that we might live eternally in his presence, right? Jesus became extremely poor so that his extreme poverty might make us rich. Even, even though this church was being persecuted and they were being martyred for their beliefs, they were very rich in Jesus Christ. There's nothing more frustrating than to see someone that is rich and have all the riches in the world, but they don't have a need for Jesus. And they're actually very extremely poor when it comes to God and comes to the word of God and their life. True riches only come one way. If you don't get anything, true riches only come one way, and that is through our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, who became poor so that we might obtain riches. And David understood this. And all, although Asaph is said to be the transcriber or author of this psalm, it's very likely that he was just transcribing the words of King David in Psalm 73:25 whom I have in heaven, but you. There's no one, there, there's none on earth that I, that I desire beside you. Right? Nothing on earth I want but you, Lord. 
That should be the way that we think, the way that we live, the way that we act and exact exactly everything that we want, God and God alone. We cannot take our riches to heaven with us. We cannot take our families and our jobs and our Porsches and our mansions and our yachts. We cannot take them to heaven. Now, I, I, I don't think it's wrong to have these things, but those don't make you rich, and we need to see that. Things do not make us rich. Christ does. This church was reduced to being beggars pretty much. Right? They were considered outcasts because they refused to bow or worship to the other gods and would not participate in pagan rituals. And they would not uh, get involved in the worshiping of Caesar, which this often led to their deaths. So in light of their circumstances, Christ called them rich in the present tense, right? He calls them rich in the present tense to reflect on what riches they have in him. All right. So they were poor, but they're rich. Now, when we get there, we're going to see the church of Laodicea was very rich, but, but very poor, as well as blind, wretched, and naked. It's kind of the opposite of this church. All right. And we're going to go jump back to... Revelation, yeah, I think I just heard my pug pug cough, so that you might have heard that in the background. Revelation 2 and verse 9, so we're going to jump to the next verse. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and they're not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, there's blasphemy in the church going on, and these people are saying that they're Jews, right? But they're not. Paul talks about this in Romans, how circumcision, which was a sign of the covenant of Abraham, is an outward sign. But Paul is saying that the circumcision needs to be of our hearts. It's not about your external, but your internal, right? It's not about your external, but your internal. It, it's not about what you do or what tribe or nation or people you come from, but it's of your heart. Christ came to change it. No longer is grace based on lineage or based on what tribe you're from, but it's based on your heart. And what was going on here in the church was that people were saying they were Jews, but they're not. And Jesus referred to this again. He refers to this again in the church of Philadelphia. So let's jump and read that in uh, chapter 3. And verse 9, Behold, I make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and they're not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. And we'll get there when we get there. Bad word about worship. We don't get worshipped. Um, true faith in Christ brings no distinction between a Jew and a Gentile, right? It's, it's no distinction between us. Paul talks about this many times in his writings, right? Let's look at Romans 10, 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. All right, Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be of Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, basically, it's the same thing today. People come in and they try to legalize the church. They were saying in order to really receive salvation and know that you have the Lord and to, to receive his grace, you need to be circumcised. You've got to be circumcised. This was, this was much of their tribulation from the unbelieving Jews. They would bring up blasphemy or false accusations against the church and against the people in order for them to get condemned. And Paul calls them a synagogue of Satan. Jesus spoke of that as well. Let's go to John 8, 44. John chapter 8 and verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
he, when he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Right? So the people that Jesus preached to did not want to believe him. They wanted to kill him. <laughs> and he's saying that you are the father of your devil. And you, ha you have a murderous heart. You have a lying tongue. And these were the people in the church of Smyrna that were doing the same thing. They were the ones blaspheming themselves and calling themselves Jews because of their being circumcised. Right? We're Jews because we're circumcised. And that's what they're trying to do, legalize this in the church. We just read what a true Jew it, it, what is in Romans, right? So we can also relate this back to the parable of the wheat and the tares, right? The tares look identical to the wheat, but becomes apparent at some point that they're not wheat based on the fruit that they bear, right? And I want to I say that again because I think it's really, really good. The tares look identical to the wheat. They grow up together. But it becomes apparent at some point that they're, no, they're not wheat based on what fruit they bear. All right, let's jump into verse 10. Trying to get these done. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Yeah, fear none of those things which shall, you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall suffer tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Okay? Now, Christ doesn't say that he's going to make this suffering, or that Christ doesn't say he's going to take this suffering away, but he tells them that they will suffer. Christ wants them to focus on him rather than the circumstances surrounding them. Christ tells them the devil will cast some of you into prison. You're going to be tried. And there's a limit here I want us to see, whether it's 10 days or whether it is literal. If it's 10 days, literal 10 days, which I believe it is, or if it's symbolic of a certain amount of time, the point is, is that Christ is telling them that there will be an end to it. And this should comfort you. Right? It reminds me of Job. Satan did a lot to Job. But the end eventually came. Right, It finally all stopped and Job was restored. So just remember though, in death or in life, there will be an end at some point and a restoration. And I think that God allows things like this to happen to the church and even in our own lives so that we can know if we're going to stand or not. Right? See, God knows if we're going to stand, and having done all to stand, we're just going to stand. He knows that. But sometimes we think we know, but we don't. Right? So sometimes things are, are brought up and allowed to happen so we know where our hearts are at. Right? Do we stand on those convictions or do we not? We, will we remain faithful to God and trust Him or not? I will trust God no matter what. I don't care if this happens, that happens, this happens. Okay, your wife dies, your dog gets run over, you lose your house and you're living in a tent. Now you're cursing. Hear what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, these things happen so we'll know where our heart truly is because the Bible tells us that a man thinks he's right in his own heart, but it leads him to destruction. All right, so these really are things, these tribulations and trials are for our benefit. Right? And we should see them as such. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I don't have these bookmarked. I'm trying to just rush through it here. I don't want to take too much time. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let me find it. There we go. There has no temptation taken you, but it's common to man, but God who is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above, that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, then he says, do not fear. Okay, this is a prophecy and a promise. Do not fear those things that are about, you're about going, you, don't, don't fear the things that you're going to suffer. Right, you're going to be persecuted, don't be afraid. God gives, gives him a promise here. Be faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. Okay, now I wanted to jump to the 10 days because I believe they're literal, but... 
scholars and and other commentators they come in and, and they believe that the ten days are a representation of the ten emperors that persecuted the church the first three hundred years. I don't know. I'm, I I throw it in here because it is part of it. So some people believe it, and I try to give us a round knowledge, a lot of knowledge, so with, that we can study ourselves and come to whatever we come to, right? Um, the 10 days represent the 10 emperors that persecuted the church would be Nero. Okay, that's where Paul was beheaded, Peter crucified upside down, Domitian, number two, John's exile to Patmos, and Nicodemus persecuted in Rome. Number three, you got Trajan, uh, Ignatius was burned at the stake. You got four, Marcus Antonius, uh, Polycarp was martyred, Septimius Severus, um, Iranius was killed, Maximus, uh, Ursula and Hippolytus were killed. Then you got Des Decius, Valerianus, or Valerianus. These are, <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, I'm torturing these names. Valerianus, I don't know, Valerianus. Um, Aurelian, and then number 10 is Diocletian. And if you, I'll probably just post them in the room there. Um, like I said, none of us know in the end. It really doesn't tell us. I think the point is, is that we're told that there's going to be tribulation, and that tribulation will to pass. Right? It may last for a season in your life, but it's nothing compared to the glory that we have in Jesus Christ, praise God, in the end. The bottom line is that they're going to suffer. Be faithful, I'll give you the crown of life. Don't let Satan twist the words you have heard and learned. Believe in me and stand fast to what you have heard, I'll give you the crown of life. Right? And we have the same concept of the crown of life in James. James 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, right? which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So we got the same idea coming out of James. Okay, and verse 11, Revelation 2, 11. He that, has, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says into the churches. He that overcomes shall not be heard of the second death. All right, so... The second death, we see that in Revelation twice. We see it in chapter 20 and verse 6 and 20 and verse 14. So let's just jump over there. Chapter 20 and verse 6, we see, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God in Christ, and shall also reign with him a thousand years. And then jump down to verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. All right, so the second death is the great white throne judgment. It's going to be where sinners will eternally be separated from God. And only those that are born again cannot be hurt by the second death. Right? I hope that through the studies, that the study of these churches, that we as children of God are going to take the studies and really search ourselves and our commitment to the things of God. Where do we stand with God? Where do we stand when it comes to dying for the cause of Christ? Will we compromise when, when, when the time comes for them, for the mark of the beast and to worship of this image comes? Right? I just pray that through these, that because there are some very strong warnings that through these letters, and they're there for a reason. Right? Look at 2 Corinthians 13.5. And I, I quote this scripture a lot because I think it's very important that we examine ourselves to see if we're of the faith, right? Paul says it, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. See, God knows. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how Jesus Christ is in you, except to be a reprobate, right? So, dear Holy Father, I ask that you would touch each one of our hearts and that you would show us your love that you have for us through your death, burial, through your resurrection, that you would open our eyes to see the truth of your security that you have given us, Father. We do know, Father, that wolves have crept into the churches today, and we ask that you would keep us from the blasphemous teachings and always lead us in the spirit and in truth, Heavenly Father. 
Allow us to take these words you have given us, implement them into our lives so that we can be that salt and that light to the world. Allow us not to become stagnant, Lord, but continue to work in our lives. Continue to draw the impurities out of our life, Heavenly Father, so that we can know where we stand with you. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your truth. We, we thank you for your many, many, many blessings that we don't thank you for most of the time. Any word that's spoken in the flesh, let it be cast down, buried, and forgotten. For those things in spirit and truth, Father, burn them in our hearts, burn them in our minds, in our spirits, and let us implement those things in our, in our lives to be that light and salt to the world. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In the name of Jesus, amen. And next, no, Friday, we will jump into the next church. Keep the faith.